Mercury Redstone 3, or Freedom 7, was the first United States human spaceflight, on May 5, 1961, piloted by astronaut Alan Shepard. Shepard's mission was a 15-minute suborbital flight with the primary objective of demonstrating his ability to withstand the high-G forces of launch and atmospheric re-entry. Shepard named his space capsule Freedom 7, setting a precedent for the remaining six Mercury astronauts naming their spacecraft. The number 7 was included in all the crewed Mercury spacecraft names to honor NASA's first group of seven astronauts. During the flight, Shepard observed the Earth and tested the capsule's attitude control system, turning the capsule around to face its blunt heat shield forward for atmospheric re-entry. Shepard and the capsule were picked up by helicopter and brought to U.S. Navy aircraft carrier USS Lake Champlain. The spacecraft for Mr. 3, Mercury Capsule No. 7, was delivered to Cape Canaveral on December 9, 1960. In late 1960, there had been a growing number of concerns about the safety of the Redstone launch vehicle. The Mr. 2 test flight, carrying Ham the chimpanzee, had experienced technical problems during the launch, leading to the spacecraft flying too high, too far and too fast. He had selected Alan Shepard as the primary pilot, with John Glenn and Gus Grissom as his backups, the other members of the Mercury 7 continued to train for later missions. Shepard's name was only announced publicly after the initial launch attempt had been cancelled, as Gilruth wished to keep his options open in the event that last-minute personnel changes were required. Glenn served as Shepard's backup on launch day, with Grissom focusing on training for Mr. 4, the next suborbital mission. The initial launch attempt, on May 2, was cancelled due to weather problems two hours and twenty minutes before the launch time, with Shepard waiting in a hangar already suited and prepared. Est. The countdown began at 8.30 p.m. the previous night, with Shepard waking up and eating a breakfast of steak and eggs with toast, coffee, and orange juice. All of the delays resulted in Shepard lying on his back in the capsule for almost three hours, by which point he complained to the blockhouse crew that he had a severe need to urinate. An irate Shepard then announced that if he could not get out for a bathroom trip, he would simply urinate in his suit. Shepard was subjected to a maximum acceleration of 6.3 grams just before the Redstone engine shut down, 2 minutes and 22 seconds after launch. Shepard now began testing manual control of the spacecraft's orientation. For redundancy purposes, the Mercury spacecraft's manual attitude control system used a different set of controlled jets than the automatic system and had its own fuel supply. When the system was activated, moving the three-axis control stick proportionally opened valves to the manual jets. Shepard gradually assumed manual control, one axis at a time, leaving the remaining axes to ASCS. First he took manual control of pitch, reorienting the spacecraft from its orbit attitude of 14 degrees nose down pitch to the retrofire attitude of 34 degrees nose down pitch, then returning to orbit attitude. Once Shepard had taken control of all three axes, he found that the spacecraft's manual response was about the same as that of the Mercury simulator. However, he could not hear the jets firing, as he could on the ground, due to the levels of background noise. Shepard's next task was to make observations of the ground from the spacecraft's periscope, which extended through the bottom of the hull beneath his feet. Shepard's craft, an earlier version of the Mercury capsule, also had two small round viewing windows, one on each side, but the periscope was its primary means for observing. During his long wait on the launch pad, Shepard had inserted a medium gray filter in the periscope to cut down on sun glare, but he had not had time to undo this before launch. Even though the escape tower was long gone, Shepard gave up on trying to change the filter out of caution, leaving it in for the rest of the flight. Although the gray filter washed out colors, Shepard was still easily able to distinguish major landmasses from clouds. With the spacecraft still under manual control, but now using the periscope rather than the panel instruments for his attitude reference, Shepard had maintained his role in yaw attitude, but he had inadvertently let the spacecraft drift in pitch. As the spacecraft approached the highest point of its suborbital arc, the start retro sequence light came on, alerting Shepard that the three retro rockets were about to fire. Shepard began adjusting his pitch nose downward toward the proper retrofire attitude of minus 34 degrees, but he only got to around orbit attitude before the first retro rocket fired. This pitch discrepancy was not critical for this flight, because Shepard's suborbital trajectory would lead to re-entry anyway, and the difference in pitch wouldn't affect Shepard's landing location much. Shepard was only testing the pilot's ability to manually control the spacecraft's attitude during retrofire. In his initial post-flight debriefing, Shepard reported that he must have somehow gotten confused about his pitch attitude, but as it turned out he was the victim of a misunderstanding. Shepard had assumed it was still set that way and deliberately adjusted his pitch high to compensate. Somehow Shepard had not been informed, 
so his compensation made his pitch too high. Shepard switched into the fly-by-wire control mode, where the pilot's motions of the three-axis control stick electrically triggered the control jets of the automatic system to fire for the desired positioning, rather than proportionally opening the manual system's control jets. Shepard heard the noise of the jettison and saw one of the straps fly past a window, but the confirmation light did not turn on. Fellow Mercury astronaut Dickie Slayton, who was acting as capsule communicator in the Mercury Control Center, confirmed to Shepard that the pack had jettisoned, so Shepard activated the manual override for the jettison system to trigger the light. Shepard reported that fly-by-wire felt smooth and gave the sensation of being fully in command of the craft, before letting the automatic systems briefly take over to reorient the capsule for re-entry. Freedom 7 tilted over on its right side about 60 degrees from an upright position, but did not show any signs of leaking, it gently righted itself after a minute, and Shepard was able to report to the circling aircraft that he had landed safely and was ready to be recovered. A recovery helicopter arrived after a few minutes, and after a brief problem with the spacecraft antenna, the capsule was lifted partly out of the water in order to allow Shepard to leave by the main hatch. 235 Turnaround Maneuver Spacecraft System Rotates Spacecraft 180 Degrees to Heat Shield Forward Attitude Computer Animation of Full Flight Using Soundtrack Recording of Dialogue Between Shepard and Mission Control